Welcome everyone. This time we're going to be talking about polymers. So this is going to serve as the background for the new rotation, the polymer rotation. So it's going to be basically the background for both the impact lab and the rate dependence lab. So let's get onto it. So what's a polymer? Polymer comes from the Greek word poly, which means many, and mer, which means part. So basically polymer, it just means many parts. It is a large molecule or a macromolecule composed of many repeating uh, subunits. If you can see on the image, we have a what we call a monomer, which is basically this small unit that's repeated many, many, many times until it forms a, a long molecule, a long chain. Polymers are different from metals and ceramic with its own little parts of materials. And as you can see, polymers can occur in nature and can be made to serve specific needs. We, had, we see many polymers, for example, wood is a type of polymer, cellulose, uh, DNA is even a polymer. So we find polymers basically everywhere. So if it's not a metal or a ceramic, it's probably a polymer. And when we talk about polymers, we usually refer to them as plastic. We say, oh, plastics, metal, plastic, ceramic, etc. But in this case, in a material's perspective, plastic is an adjective, not a noun. We call polymers plastics because they deform plastically, meaning that when you deform them, when you stretch them, they deform irreversibly. So once you stretch a polymer, usually most of them do not return back to its original position, and those they get deformed permanently. They go into the plastic section of the formation. So that's what we, we call them plastics. So plastic in this case is an adjective, not a noun. So how do polymers look? If you were to think about how polymer chains looks, how if you were to see on a molecular level, you can see that it's made of long chains that are randomly ordered. And you can think of them as long, uh, as like a bowl of spaghetti. You see it doesn't have order. All of the molecules, all of the chains are going everywhere around. So that's basically how it looks. Instead of being crystals like crystals that we have seen on the metals, this one is just randomly ordered uh, chains. So now let's see the two main types of the two main groups of polymers. We have a thermoset and thermoplastic, and each one is divided into its own categories as well. So the main two the main two group of polymers are the thermoplastics and the thermosets. We see the thermoplastics are those polymers that can't be melted. So think of them as butter. When you have butter in a solid, in a solid shape, if you apply heat, it will melt. And when you cool it back, it will go back to being a solid. So that's how thermoplastics behave. Those are the polymers that can melt, those that can be recyclable. For example, uh, your plastic bottles or water bottles, milk cartons, stuff like that. Those are the polymers that do end up uh, being recyclable. And on the, on the other hand, we have our thermosets, which are the polymers that do not melt. So think of them like an analogy will be bread. When you have already bread that you eat, when you apply heat, it will just toast and eventually if you keep continue uh, applying heat, it will just char. So instead of the bread melting, at this point it will just turn to ash, it will just get burned and it will just turn to ash. So that's how thermosets are. They do not melt. Once you shape them, once you have them ready, when you apply heat, they will just degrade. So let's, let's go into thermosets a little bit more. So as you can see, a thermoset is a polymer that's irreversibly hardened by curing from a soft, solid, or viscous liquid prepolymer or resin. So as we said, Thermosets are those polymers that when you cure them, they become hard and it's an irreversible process, meaning you cannot go back to them being a, how they were before. And by curing, we mean it's the process of toughening or hardening a polymer by cross-linking. So now you will ask, well, what's cross-linking? Well, cross-linking are bonds that link polymer, ch polymer chains to another. If you, see he, if you see over here in the image, in the bottom, we see we have polymer chain A, polymer chain B, and polymer chain C. 
So these are three independent uh, long chains of a polymer. And you can see these blue uh, small chains are the crosslinks. So without crosslinking, the chain A, B, and C, they can move past each other, they can slip, they can move around. But once they're crosslinked, you can see how they're, it's connecting all three chains, so it's preventing movement. And by preventing this movement, it makes the polymer harder or tougher. One example of this that we can see is uh, in rubber tires. Rubber uh, tires are made of rubber, but rubber in itself, it's an elastomer. You can stretch it, you can move it, it can flow, it loses its shape. But once you add sulfur, it, it gets crosslinked, so now, now it, remain, it retains its shape, and now you can use it for a different application, for example, the tires. So I mean, imagine if your car tires, they, they weren't vulcanized, overnight they will just deflate and they will become flat. But it's thanks to the sulfur, sulfur molecules that are linking the rubber chains together that gives it the tires to maintain its shape and to make them uh, tougher and durable for the road, etc. So that was cross-linking. It's just small bonds that link polymer chains to each other, making the polymer harder. And see, these are chemically linked, chemically bonded. Even though you, if you apply heat, instead of them melting, they will just degrade uh, with temperature. Now let's, let's look at the thermoplastic. So thermoplastic, we have our two categories. We have our amorphous and we have our semi-crystalline. So these are the two types of thermoplastics. And as we said, thermoplastics are the polymers that are the most common ones, the ones that we recycle, the ones that we use mainly every day. So the amorphous, they come from the, word, the Greek word amorphous, which means shapeless. So just like we saw with the spaghetti uh, bowl, these type of polymers, they don't have a definite shape. Their molecules are just randomly oriented. They just this water is just a, a mess. And because of that or in that way they are oriented, they, since they don't have definite order, they have the same directions. They have the same properties on all directions. So all the thermal properties, mechanical properties, electrical properties, etc., all of them will be the same on the X, Y, and Z axis. So we call that an isotropic uh, polymer, that all the properties are the same on all directions. Also, because these polymers don't have a definite shape or order, these solids don't have a sharp melting point or definite heat of fusion. These polymers will melt. We say that a characteristic of these polymers is that they do melt, but since they don't have that order, of they don't have that molecules that are neatly ordered, they won't have a specific melting temperature. It will be over a range of uh, temperature, depending how long the chains are, it could be before room temperature, after a long range, small range. So there's no definite point where these polymers will melt. And they're usually transparent. One characteristic of them is that they're good for optic applications. For example, in the glasses, when you have glasses, a metal polymer instead of actual glass, there's probably a transparent amorphous polymer. On the other hand, we have our semi-crystalline. And a crystalline solid is that in which all the particles are ordered in a 3D uh, pattern. And this order, this arrangement of order um, of the molecules is what we call a crystal. Just like in metals, crystals were the order structure that the metals have. Again, here in this case, crystal is that order structure. So crystalline polymers is just polymers that do have some order in the way their molecules are oriented. However, there's, there is no 100% crystalline polymers. There's only some semi-crystalline polymers, meaning they have some characteristic of both amorphous and crystalline. As you can see over here in the picture, we have some chains that are uh, randomly oriented, and we have our sections that are neatly arranged, folded into each other. These are our small crystals. So this is what a semi-crystalline polymer looks like. Since these polymers have uh, some order in different parts of the, of the material, it will have properties that are different on all directions. So we call this anisotropic. So instead of having the properties all the same everywhere like amorphous, semi-crystallines have the properties different in every axis. 
because these polymers do have some order, they do have a specific melting point in heat of fusion. So when you test these polymers, when you want to melt them, this will be those polymers that you know for sure where the melting point will be at. These polymers usually look opaque as opposed to transparent because when the crystals, are, uh, when these polymers have crystals on them, if the light, uh, if you ref if you shine light onto these polymers, due to the crystal orientation, some light might be refracted, reflected, uh, ref reflected, refracted, and so on. So instead of the light just passing all the way through, it will just be bounced. It just it will just bounce back. So it will look kind of opaque, just like the milk carton that is not really clear, transparent, it's kind of opaque-ish. So that's what it means. So here you can see just a summary of how they are, amorphous versus crystalline, what each one has, uh, the regular patterns, repeated patterns for crystallines, uh, isotropic and amorphous, anisotropic and crystalline, etc. So another important aspect of polymers is the class transition temperature. So just like we did, we did the DVTT for metals, Polymers also experience uh, a change in its properties, of physical, a change in its physical properties depending on temperature. So they can go from being uh, behaving like in a brittle fashion to a ductile fra uh, fashion. But instead of calling them ductile and brittle, we call them glassy or rubbery in this case. So the glass transition temperature is that temperature in which they switch from being relatively brittle or glassy in severe, more viscous or rubbery, a little bit more ductile. So you have to find the glass transition temperature, usually the, uh, defined as Tg, glass temperature of glass uh, transition. So we use a DSC, just like we did the phase diagram in the last rotation to find the melting temperature for the alloy in it and everything. In a DSC, the way we determine where the TG of a polymer is, is by looking where there's a step or a shoulder. For example, that you can see here, this is this little nice step, that's the transition of the temperature at which it goes from being glassy to more rubbery. And it will happen below the melting temperature. So different polymers have different TGs not all of them have the same transition temperature, transition temperature, just like in metals. So let's put a situation. Let's imagine we are right now, we are at room temperature, 25 Celsius, 75, uh, 77 Fahrenheit, and we have different polymers present. If the Tg of one of the, poly the polymers we have is below the room temperature, at this room temperature, this polymer will behave more rubbery will be a little bit more elastic, will be more soft, will be softer, will flow a little bit better. An example of that in this graph you can see is the, this PVAC whose transition temperature is at 19 Celsius. So since we are right now at 25, this polymer will behave more rubbery, its elastic modulus will be uh, lower, it will be less stiff and so on. On the other hand, if the polymers that we have right now, if their TG is way above the room temperature, then they will behave more like a glassy, they will be more will behave more brutally. And an example of those could be all the other polymers that we have here. For example, uh, uh, polycarbonate over here, PC. You can see that its uh, glass transition temperature is 146.35 Celsius. So after that temperature, it will behave like a rubber. Before the temperature, meaning right now at 25 Celsius, it will behave more like a glass. So those properties are the ones that we want to use for different applications. So polycarbonate is the ones that you have mainly in glasses. So if your glasses, your reading glasses, if they're not made out of glass, if they're made of a polymer, it's usually polycarbonate. And it makes sense that you're uh, goggles or glasses are hard right now. You want them to be hard so you can prevent your eyes from an injury or etc. If they were more rubbery, then your glasses will just start melting on your face or your goggles right now. So you can see, so if they have the TG below room temperature, 
they will behave properly at room temperature. If they have a TG uh, higher than room temperature, they will behave like glasses, like something like hard at room temperature. So now let's, let's look at the rate dependence. We see how the TG has its effects. So if it behaves rubbery or glassy, it will, absorb, it will affect how much energy you're absorbing, right? Just like the DVDT, when you're impacting these polymers, uh, they could either uh, absorb more energy and uh, deform, or they can absorb less energy and just break and shatter, etc. And, and th now the rate dependence also has a play on the properties. So the rate dependent, you can see the mechanical properties of polymers are dependent as well on the strain rate, temperature, and pressure. So let's take for example the silly putty. If we have a little uh, a little sample of silly putty, if we stretch it real quick, real fast, like suddenly, it will just break like if it was like a hard material, right? Like a clean uh, break. However, if we do the same thing, but we do it over a longer time, we do it even slower, it will start to elongate a little more before it actually fails, before it actually breaks in two. So that's what happens in polymers. The rate at which you test the polymers, the, way, the rate at which you elongate them in a tensile test will affect the strain and the stress, the modulus, etc., etc., everything of the polymer you're trying to do. So you see here in the first graph, you see we have different rates. We have 0 0.0001, uh, whatever units per second, 0 0.3, 800, and 1,400. So you can see the higher the rate, the higher the modulus, but the lower the strain they experience. However, on the other hand, the lower the rate, the less the stress they will hold, however, they elongate the most. Over here, you can see the same thing. We have 50 millimeters per minute, 5 millimeters per minute, and 0.5 millimeters per minute. And you can see over here again, the higher the rate, the higher the modulus, but the shorter the strain. So what's happening in this moment right now is that you have your tensile sample, you have all the molecules randomly oriented, whether they're crystalline, semi-crystalline, or amorphous. And when you test it, when you elongate it at a fast rate, the molecules, they don't have enough time to or orient themselves, so they will just shatter, it will be a clean break, it will not even elongate as much. However, when you test at a slower rate, you're giving the molecules more time for them to orient, for them to arrange in, in the elongation, in the axis of where the force is being applied. So when they do that, they change the elongate. So it gives the, molecule, it gives the polymer more time, more flexibility. Uh, it allows it to elongate and stretch more before the molecules actually break. So here they break because they have some knots. You don't allow them to untangle. But over here, after they get on tango, then it provides for a longer, a more ductile behavior. So that's it for the polymer's background. I hope this helps. I will be providing this PowerPoint for everyone so you guys can see and study it. So from here, go to your individual lab, whether it's the rate dependence or the impact testing, and you can start with your experiments. Thank you.